Uh, welcome everybody to this evening's lecture. Vet Education is proud to present a free webinar on gallbladder mucoceles in dogs. Where are we now? Now this particular webinar is being brought to you by a course called Abdominal Emergencies in Small Animal Practice. And we're actually running two courses at Vet Education this year on Abdominal Emergencies in Small Animal Practice. The first one, which starts just in about 10 days time, so I'll just bring up the next slide here, starts April 12, uh, is a four week online course. It's all about the medical emergencies. I'm gonna take a little bit of time out in the middle of this session, just before we start about treatment of gallbladder mucosal and tell you a little bit more about it, plus an exciting new surprise uh, that you'll get if you register for the course that I just found out about this week. It's pretty cool, so uh, stay tuned for that. All right, let's talk about gallbladder mucoceles in dogs. Where are we now? How many of you, and please feel free just to type away in the chat box there, how many of you have seen a patient with a gallbladder mucosele and, there's part two to the question, and sort of thought, great, I think this is a gallbladder mucosele, what do I do about it? Do I treat it medically? Does it go to surgery? How many of you have had that question? What do I do with this? What do I do with this gallbladder mucosele? Is it bad if I leave it med and treat it medically, or should I be sending it for surgery straight away? I'll just wait a couple of seconds while you type your answers in there to that question. But this is the sort of thing we're quite commonly faced with when we ultrasound the abdomens of dogs and sometimes cats as well, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we see this gallbladder material within the lumen and sometimes it's gravity dependent and you know, that's pretty common, this is a gravity dependent gallbladder sludge and sometimes we see this lump of gallbladder sediment sitting in the middle of the gallbladder. The dog may not have any symptoms at all of gallbladder illness uh, or liver illness. There may not be any vomiting or anorexia or um, you know, diarrhea, um, decreased appetite or anything else. Uh, they may be clinically uh, in your uh, clinic for another reason, and this may be something like an incidental finding. And so we're left with this decision, okay, now I've found this thing, what do I do with it? And this is a question that I just wanted to try to help shed a little bit more light on because of something uh, me as an emergency vet, uh, we see quite commonly when we're ultrasounding the abdomens of patients that we suspect has got pancreatitis or we suspect we're looking for a foreign body or something of that nature and sometimes we'll find this gallbladder sludge. And so what I've done is I've gone back through the literature for about 20 years. Most of the literature that's in the notes that you have uh, uh, been emailed um, or that you can download just by clicking the handouts at the top right of the screen there. Most of the references are from the last 10 years because I've tried to keep things really current because there is some stuff that we thought we knew that we don't know anymore. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the value of keeping up to date with literature. So I just wanted to summarize what we did know and a little bit about what we don't know about gallbladder mucoceles. So let's get underway. What is the definition of a gallbladder mucosele? Well, it's got several characteristics. We have a distended gallbladder due to and the choice of words here is really important by the accumulation of abnormally thick gelatinous bile that's produced by the gallbladder epithelium. So this here, right here, suggests that uh, the gallbladder epithelium is at fault here. For whatever reason, the gallbladder epithelium secretes this thick, gelatinous, abnormally thick bile, okay, and it doesn't flow very well out of the gallbladder. In fact, it sometimes just sits there and can become a solid sedimentary body in some cases. Now uh, we'll talk a bit more about what causes that in a few slides time. But you can imagine now if you've got a gallbladder that's distended with thick gelatinous bile, okay, we can end up with a little bit of backflow of bile or poor bile flow through our cystic ducts and our bile ducts there uh, within our liver. And so we can potentially get an extension uh, into uh, into our liver, which can cause cholangiohepatopathy or cholangiohepatitis. Uh, and progressive distension of our gallbladder, if our gallbladder mucosa continues to produce 
this uh, thick gelatinous bile, uh, it can stretch the gallbladder to the point at which the gallbladder wall becomes ischemic and we can get ischemic necrosis and even rupture of our gallbladder. And, when, and the net result of that is that we end up with a patient with oftentimes acute illness and bile peritonitis, which in uh, many patients, not all, but many patients can be a pretty serious event and can cause systemic inflammation and sepsis and even death as well. So why do we care, and I've alluded to this a little bit, why do we care about gallbladder mucoceles? Why do we not just look at that sediment on our ultrasound and go, well, there's sediment there, I'm, I'm not too worried. Well, the gallbladder can rupture, as I've just intimated. The gallbladder can become infected, and if we end up with a rupture of our gallbladder that has infected bile in it, then we can end up with a septic peritonitis. Um, we can end up with extra hepatic biliary duct obstruction. So we can end up with that thick, tenacious, gelatinous mucus blocking our common bile duct, and that can be pretty serious for us as well. Uh, we can have systemic inflammatory response syndrome as a result of the inflammation that can be caused by bile leaking out of a ruptured biliary duct or ruptured gallbladder. And we can also have sepsis, as we've already mentioned. So let's talk uh, methodically about gallbladder mucosal and talk about what we know about the causes of it. Basically, the sentence down the bottom of this slide is the one that I want to highlight. Our current understanding of this disease is incomplete. There are some very, very smart people who've done some really cool work looking at uh, the composition of bile and what's missing in patients with gallbladder mucosal and what's there in excess in the bile of patients with gallbladder mucosal. And I'm going to shed a little bit of light on what these uh, very, very smart researchers have done. But essentially, when we're trying to gain knowledge, we oftentimes start off with, you know, case reports and we analyze these case reports. Uh, someone then does a, a, a retrospective study to look at a whole lot of patients with this particular condition. Uh, then we may end up with a meta-analysis, we might end up with some prospective research coming out of that and some more insights. Now with gallbladder mucosal, we're sort of traveling around this circle, uh, we're probably in about the one and a half to two times around this circle right now, uncovering more and more things uh, or more and more components of knowledge about gallbladder mucosal, but we don't know every Thing that we want to know about this condition and the cause of it just yet. So what do we know? Well, what we do know is that there's abnormal gallbladder mucus production, as I've already mentioned. Uh, one study looked at uh, the genetics of what was going on and the composition of bile in patients with gallbladder mucosal and compared it to the bile of patients who did not have gallbladder mucosal. And what they found was that there was excess secretion of this MUC5AC gel forming mucin in patients that had gallbladder mucosal. It's a highly cross-linked uh, cross um, mucin and it gets entangled with mucin interacting proteins within the gallbladder itself. And so as this mucus is uh, is uh, being excito exocytosed out of the gallbladder epithelial cells, the affected granules don't unpack as well because they're all stuck to each other and they remain tethered to one another as well as tethered to the gallbladder epithelium. And when we understand this, it makes a lot of sense why we get this sort of star-shaped or stellate little pattern of mucus that seems to be partly adhered or looks like it's emanating from the gallbladder lining as, lining as well. There is certainly a breed predisposition. We see this uh, quite commonly in Shetland sheepdogs, Cocker Spaniels, Miniature Snouts, Pomeranians and Chihuahuas. Amongst the whole range of other dogs, small and medium sized dogs seem to be the uh, seem to be the most commonly affected, but it can occur in larger breed dogs as well. So there's definitely a breed predisposition in all of the retrospective studies that have been carried out in dogs. Uh, these breeds are overrepresented. And I saw someone said, yes, they have seen this in a Shetland sheepdog before, and that would certainly be one of the breeds. They're the poster child for, uh, for gallbladder mucosal. What else do we know? 
that in many dogs with gallbladder mucosal, there can be an underlying endocrinopathy. And the two endocrinopathies that appear most commonly are hyperadrenocorticism and hypo thyroidism. There are some other endocrinopathies like diabetes mellitus, for example, that are mentioned in the literature, um, but not with any degree of consistency. Hyperadrenocorticism and hypothyroidism are the two endocrinopathies that, uh, that are frequently found in association with gallbladder mucosal. And there may be a reason why these two are particularly at fault, and that is that they both can cause hypercholesterolemia in patients by virtue of alterations in the patient's metabolism. And that in itself is a known predisposing risk factor to gallbladder mucosal. What else do we know? Well, uh, gallbladder mucosal patient differences in Gallbladder mucosal, the bile of gallbladder mucoseals, uh, sorry, the serum of patients with gallbladder mucoseals has 33 times less serum um, uh, AMP, okay, cyclic AMP. There are lower quantities of energy producing nucleotide precursors and increasing citric acid intermediaries. And this indicates that there is an excess in metabolic energy as well as a carbon surplus. Now, what do we mean by that? If we have less cyclic AMP here, what it basically means is that we're using less ATP in order to generate it within the intracellular environment. So there are cellular metabolic processes that are not taking place as a result of whatever underlying metabolic condition predisposes patients to developing, uh, uh, to developing gallbladder mucosal. In gallbladder mucosal as well, there is an abnormal amino acid and protein metabolism and increased cholesterol synthesis that we mentioned before and diversion to bile formation. So we end up with a, a patients who are producing a lot more bile, uh, but in patients with defective mucin secretion, this really doesn't help things at all. There's also a decrease in compounds that stimulate bile duct fluid secretion, such as adenosine, cyclic AMP, and cholic acid. So we end up with a, um, a more thick, tenacious bile and a less aqueous bile. Now, uh, medical treatment, one of the mainstays of medical treatment is to use a drug, ursodeoxycholic acid, which is an aqueous bile solution that's supposed to uh, generate, it's, a, it's a quite a potent cholinergic because it, it uh, uh, increases the aqueous content of bile, and with it, the hope and thought is that it may actually help flush out our bile ducts of some of this thick, tenacious mucus. We'll get on to how successful that is in a little bit, uh, but basically in patients with gallbladder mucosal, we have a naturally occurring decrease in, in these compounds that would normally stimulate bile duct fluid secretion. A couple of questions uh, here that I've just seen. Uh, one I just want to address now because it talks about exogenous corticosteroid uh, administration. Is that a possible risk factor? I guess it could potentially be a risk factor. Um, you will have to excuse the kookaburras outside my window here that are making their evening racket if you can hear birdsong in the background. <laughs> so that's, uh, we live in Australia and there are lots of loud, noisy birds at this time of night. So, um, so potentially exogenous corticosteroid administration could be a, uh, a, a potential risk factor. It is not uh, spoken about or written in the literature all that much. Most of the hyperadrenocorticism that has been written about in relation to gallbladder mucosal is uh, endogenous uh, hyperadrenocorticism, not iatrogenic hyperadrenocorticism. But great question. Thank you so much for that. When pathologists have looked at the gallbladders of patients that have had a cholecystectomy, what they found is that this hyperplasia of these mucus secreting glands in the gallbladder wall and an accumulation of mucus within the lumen. So some of you will have uh, mentioned or read in the past about certain things about disordered gallbladder motility, that perhaps there may be a motility disorder within the gallbladder that leads to a buildup of gallbladder secretions within the lumen itself, um, that there may be some potential 
uh, problems with gallbladder obstruction, either through coliliths or infections, neoplasia and those sorts of things. Um, that infection, ascending infection from the small intestine up the biliary tract or, or even hematogenous infection may be a, a risk factor. And in the case of uh, certainly Shetland sheepdogs there, their genetic defect uh, was written about in the literature about ATP binding cassette subfamily B member four, so ABCB4 gene. And what we now know through subsequent uh, research and clinical experiences that these things are no longer thought to be significant risk factors for the development of gallbladder mucosal. And uh, that's a, a great question, Jaws just asked here, does gallbladder mucosal predispose or are they a risk factor for biliary infection? So can we have a gallbladder mucosal? And because we've got a mucosal, does that make us more likely to get uh, biliary tract infections? And the short answer to that question, I'm gonna spoiler alert for what I'm gonna talk about later on, is that it does not appear so. And there's some really interesting literature around that that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So. You know, some of these things like disordered gallbladder motility, this was written about in a study in 2012 uh, that's subsequently been disproven as a as a known risk factor for gallbladder mucosal. The uh, ABCB4 uh, genetic defect has also been disproven in subsequent studies as well. So this really highlights the shifting nature of our knowledge base with gallbladder mucoseals. So it's not that these studies were bad, it's just that we know now things that we didn't know before. And this was highlighted in this uh, particular article. Yeah, it was 2012 that that particular article came out. So just to summarize what we know about the pathogenesis, okay, it's incompletely understood. There is increased production of abnormal gel forming mucus by the gallbladder wall. Now this tells me something about how I want to treat this disease. If I remove the gallbladder wall, i.e. I take out the gallbladder, then this problem can go away. Um, there's certainly defective mucin proteins that contribute to abnormal mucus, and a mucosal can produce a pressure necrosis of the gallbladder wall, leading to gallbladder rupture, and it can become complicated by you know, infection, which I'll talk a little bit more later on as I've already suggested. So that's really where our current understanding is. I mentioned incomplete right at the start, and I'm sure that you will agree that there is certainly an incomplete understanding of our pathogenesis of this disease, but we are making some really good headway, at least on the characterization of where this problem starts, and that is the, the gallbladder epithelium and the type of mucus characteristics. It means that the chances of medical therapy with cholearetics actually dissolving this mucus is really, really slim. So this again uh, informs us a little bit about how we might want to treat this. It also makes us think about concurrent endocrinopathies and the fact that if we discover a gall gallbladder mucosal, we need to be looking at the rest of our patient and sensibly selecting maybe appropriate diagnostic tests to perhaps evaluate for adrenal gland function and thyroid gland function as well. of this condition. Oops, skipped ahead a couple of, oh no, one slide. Here we go. There is a br wide breed range in the literature as far as signalment is concerned. We've already mentioned the Shetland sheepdogs, Cocker Spaniels, Terriers, Poodles, Schnauzers. Someone mentioned they saw a lot of Schnauzers with this disease. Um, cats can get gallbladder mucosal. They're not written about a lot in the literature, but there are two documented cases that I could uncover. There may be more in the literature, but there are certainly two that I could find. Um, the average age is around about uh, 10 years of age. So we're looking at middle-aged uh, patients, typically um, medium to small breed uh, sized dogs, but don't forget this can be a disease present in large dogs as well. Concurrent endocrinopathy, and interestingly in Shetland sheepdogs, there was one study that looked at risk factors in Shetland sheepdogs, and they found that if a patient had imidacloprid, they were 9.3 times more likely to develop a gallbladder um, mucosal if they had previously been treated with imidacloprid. So if you've got a Shetland sheep log that's been on imidacloprid and that develops a gallbladder mucosal, um, you have that clinical picture. So this is just one of those random things that came up. 
Um, Anupam, good question. In cats, is this related, is a gallbladder mucus seal related to triaditis and is it in pure breed cats? With the only N equals two, I can't really comment on the breed predisposition. Um, but you do raise a really interesting question that uh, inflammation of the, the biliary tract and potential infection, maybe concurrent pancreatitis and cholangiohepatitis may be risk factors. We don't really know enough about cats, but I think that it's something, you know, if you have a cat with triaditis uh, that has biliary sludge, I'd certainly be wanting to document what happens to that uh, gallbladder material once your pancreatic and hepatic inflammation subsides a little bit. Um, there doesn't appear to be any sex predisposition in these patients either. Clinical signs that we see of significant uh, gallbladder mucus eels. And I say significant because there can be patients who are completely asymptomatic with gallbladder mucus eel. By the time we see symptoms, usually something's going wrong with our patients. So these guys are vomiting, uh, they have anorexia or hyperexia, so just a, a little bit off their food. Uh, they may have diarrhea, they may just be a little bit quieter than normal as well. Once their gallbladder ruptures, the clinical signs become a little more obvious and uh, a little more serious as far as the patient is concerned and certainly as far as our need to manage them is concerned. So we get abdominal pain or splinting. We might have that right cranial quadrant pain that we frequently associate with patients that have pancreatitis, for example, and the symptoms are quite similar. We can have patients that are in shock. They might be dehydrated, tachypneic, tachycardic. Uh, they, uh, with gallbladder mucus seal, they may develop a post-hepatic or even hepatic jaundice. Uh, they may have abdominal distension as well if they have a localized peritonitis with fluid extravasation from the intravascular space into the abdominal cavity. And some patients, if they have uh, comorbidities, may have polyuria and polydipsia as a result of perhaps uh, Cushing's disease, hyperadrenocorticism or hypothyroidism, or they may even have uh, diabetes mellitus as well. Joe, I'm a little unsure of uh, the mechanism mechanism for gallbladder mucus eels that is proposed uh, following imidacloprid administration in those shelties uh, that was really just an observational study uh, and I think that, that we need to probably do some more research to uncover why that is the case. There wasn't a proposed mechanism in the paper that outlined that. It was really an observational type of study but I think it would be really interesting to know what's going on behind that. So nobody, no doubt somebody who's read that paper who's working in an institution where they can do that sort of thing is probably, you know, uh, frothing at the mouth, hopefully not literally, but they're probably really enthusiastic about finding out uh, about that. I'd be really interested in learning more about it myself. As far as laboratory analysis, we have a patient that has got post-hepatic disease. They've got uh, biliary tract disease. So it's not that unusual that we will see elevations in total bilirubin, uh, elevation in alkaline phosphatase, uh, particularly in the dog. Uh, alkaline phosphatase has got a really short half-life, around four to five hours in the cat. So you might see mild elevations in alkaline phosphatase in the cat, much more likely to see them in the dog. And, uh, and you might find elevated cholesterol as well. Interestingly, in a couple of reviews that I read on laboratory analysis, they said cholesterol may be elevated or it might be normal uh, or it might even be low. So cholesterol, if it's elevated, yay, you can uh, uh, potentially get excited that you have a potential risk factor, but it could be normal. Just bear in mind that you can get uh, patients with normal blood cholesterol that have uh, gallbladder mucus heal as well. Um, electrolyte abnormalities usually reflect patients that are vomiting. So things like hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and hypochloremia may be present. You might have a metabolic acidosis present as well. Uh, you can, in patients with pancreatitis, see elevations in amylase and lipase. And if you're doing SNAP uh, CPL tests and SNAP uh, uh, FPL test, then they may be elevated as well. Blood lactate elevations are elevated usually in association with hypovolemia. 
and patients that have severe illness. So uh, there's some thought that elevations in blood lactate are not necessarily always due to um, hypoxia in tissues, but that uh, a hyperlactatemia can be the result of excessive uh, noradrenaline release from, release from the adrenal gland in severe illness. So typically we see blood lactate elevations of patients with severe acute illness. So when you see uh, there's massive elevations in blood lactate concentrations, think not only hypoperfusion but acute severe illness and noradrenaline release in these patients. Um, hypoalbuminemia from typically uh, sometimes gastrointestinal losses if they're severe enough, uh, but remember albumin is an acute phase, a negative acute phase protein. So an acute systemic inflammation, we'll oftentimes see hypoalbuminemia before we see net appreciable loss even from our intravascular space into the interstitial spaces as well. As far as our hemogram is concerned, we oftentimes see a leukocytosis with a neutrophilia, some evidence of hemoconcentration, so pack cell volume might be normal to slightly elevated. Uh, we can have thrombocytopenia and elevated clotting times as our patients develop DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy once they start to develop severe systemic illness, typically following gallbladder rupture and bile peritonitis. Um, other things we might see in patients if we have a patient that has abdominal fluid accumulation, if you perform abdominocentesis and if you're ultrasounding these patients and you find free abdominal fluid, get some of that fluid, run a and abdominal fluid bilirubin concentrations because oftentimes the abdominal fluid bilirubin concentration will be much, much more significantly elevated than the serum uh, bilirubin concentrations. Um, inflammatory cells uh, may be present within the abdominal fluid. Intracellular bacteria may be present as well if there's secondary bacterial con uh, contamination or complication of your peritonitis and fluid lactate concentration is oftentimes higher than blood lactate concentrations. Got a good question uh, just uh, from Anupam, just wanting me to recap again why we sometimes have low albumin with gallbladder mucosal again. We'll oftentimes see it in patients that have gallbladder rupture. So this is not something necessarily that, you, that you're going to necessarily see in a patient that looks like it's got an intact gallbladder wall, the patient's relatively asymptomatic, a lot of times those patients don't necessarily have any alterations in albumin. Um, but once you get severe systemic illness, so if you've got a ruptured gallbladder, you end up with bile peritonitis, you'll get recruitment of a lot of inflammatory cells uh, due to the damage that those um, bile acids will cause to the surface of the liver and the abdominal wall and the intestine and so on. And that will trigger off a systemic inflammatory response. Now albumin is what's called a negative acute phase protein. That is its production rate decreases in the liver in patients with acute illness. So uh, albumin production slows in the liver of patients with acute severe um, severe illness like systemic inflammatory uh, response syndrome and sepsis. So hopefully that explains a little bit why that is also the case. In addition to that, patients with systemic inflammation also have an increase in capillary permeability. So albumin is able to leave the intravascular space and move across the uh, capillary membrane and sit in the interstitial spaces where you know it doesn't do anything particularly wonderful there but it just leaks out because we have an increase in capillary permeability secondary to systemic inflammation. So hopefully that that answers your question. Uh, question, can we run fluid from abdominocentesis in your routine biochemistry uh, machine? Um, I would spin it down in case there's some uh, in case there's some particulate matter in there, but you can certainly measure things like bilirubin in your uh, in your in clinic uh, in clinic uh, blood analyzer. Another question: What are the underlying causes to have persistent or even higher ALT and ALK FOS even after cholecystectomy? And uh, assuming Cushing's has been ruled out, um, I'm going to get to that question a little bit later on because that's uh, that's something that we see occasionally in patients that have had cholecystectomy. In fact, there's a fair number of patients who have persistent elevations in their liver enzymes. I'm not entirely sure why that is. 
Um, do we only see bilirubin in the abdominal fluid if there's rupture? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, so it's usually the fluid accumulations in the abdomen usually only occur if you've got gallbladder rupture and secondary inflammation, uh, uh, secondary to the, the fact that you've got bile sitting free in the abdominal cavity and it causes a lot of tissue damage. Awesome. Such great questions. Thank you so much. Now let's get to the crux of diagnosis, which is ultrasound, because that's pretty much how we're going to diagnose these. Uh, we, we see immobile echogenic bile. Sometimes you'll see these striations. Now I'll just see if I can activate my little drawing tool, so I, I'm, I'm feeling like I want to point to some stuff here. And let's choose a color. Oh, I'm red, green, colorblind. So I really apologize if this color is going to be really odd for you guys, but it'll look great for me, I'm sure. We see these striations coming out here. Hopefully that you can see that blue or purple or whatever it is. These striations sort of appearing, they sort of come out like a little star pattern there within the gallbladder there. Um, interestingly, we've spoken about abdominal fluid and do we only see abdominal fluid with gallbladder rupture? Short answer to that question is yes. We're most likely to see uh, fluid accumulations in the abdominal cavity from gallbladder mucosal after the gallbladder has ruptured. Here's the twist. Ultrasound has a sensitivity for picking up gallbladder rupture as low as 56.1%. So we're going to miss, you know, 43.9% of these patients that have gallbladder rupture. Okay, so if you've got free fluid in the abdomen, I would be thinking I'd definitely be trying to get a sample of that fluid and checking things out to see if gallbladder rupture is on the cars because it might not look on your ultrasound image as if your gallbladder has ruptured. So if you've got free abdominal fluid, this is a really important fluid to aspirate because it can give you a little bit more information about whether or not you need to be scheduling stabilization and surgery for this patient sooner rather than later. Um, interestingly uh, as well, some patients with gallbladder mucosal can look like they don't have gallbladder mucosal on an ultrasound. Uh, so one paper mentioned the sensitivity for detection of gallbladder mucosal is low as 80%. So there are still 20% of patients that uh, might have gallbladder mucosal that look like they don't have gallbladder mucosal as well. Now, great question here that I can see. Is there any chance of a gallbladder mucosal that don't appear like a kiwi fruit, more like a circular hyper echogenic uh, mass inside the gallbladder? That is absolutely brilliant because yes, it is possible. Um, here we have, um, here immobile, oh, what have I done? Um, immobile echogenic bile can be grade one. There's actually a grading system, six grades, uh, well, seven if you count rupture, but six grades of, of gallbladder mucosal that have been described by the wonderful expert ultrasound imaging people. It's written in veterinary radiology and I'll, uh, I've referenced the article in your notes. If any of you would like the full text of that, then you can just email Charisma after the lecture and we'll get that to you uh, with the recording. But basically, uh, grade one is immobile echogenic bile. If you just have a lump of something sitting inside your gallbladder that's non-gravity dependent particularly, um, that is a grade one gallbladder mucosal. So in answer to your question, Jose, yes, you can have just a lump of stuff sitting inside the gallbladder. That is a grade one gallbladder mucosal. Absolutely right. Then you can have an incomplete stellate pattern. We see this on this patient here. There's not com not quite complete stellate pattern. Okay, uh, We can get a typical stellate pattern where we end up with much uh, greater, uh, much uh, or much greater number of little uh, stellate fingers that reach the gallbladder wall. And then for grades four, five, and six, we end up with this classic kiwi fruit like pattern. So here's one example here. Here's another example here where we get this radiating out. And as things move on, we can end up with a little circle in the middle. And this can be hypoechoic circle in the middle with a radiating uh, pattern to the outside. So if I was to classify this image in the lower right, um, I would say that there is a kiwi like pattern with residual essential echogenic bile or a kiwi-like pattern and stellate combination. So this would probably be a grade four, if a grade four, maybe a grade five, if I was to look at, at, uh, at this image in the lower right. For the image on the left, I'd be saying that's an incomplete or typical stellate pattern. It's between a grade two and a grade three.
Okay, now there are in the paper that I mentioned before, there are some examples of uh, of these as well. So here we see in the top left uh, hand side in image A, we have this, uh, just this mass of, uh, of of stuff that's appearing within the gallbladder lumen. In type 2, this has been defined as an incomplete stellate pattern where we've got a pretty poor effort on behalf of this uh, gallbladder mucosal to form any sort of stars at all. Uh, we have in C here, we can see that we've got lots of little fingers reaching the outside. Uh, we can see in, in uh, image D here, this is the kiwi fruit like pattern and stellate combination. And in image 5, we've got this classic kiwi fruit pattern here. Uh, with residual central echogenic bile. You notice that there's some of these little dots here are, are, are hypoechoic in here as well. Now, is there any correlation between gallbladder grade and severity? Uh, now, that's another, you guys are just absolutely awesome with your questions. And again, it was something that I was going to talk about later, but why not now? Because the questions come up now. Jose, there does not seem to be any correlation between the grade and the severity of illness that the patient has. So you don't have to wait for a grade one to get to a grade five before your patient becomes clinically ill. So your patient can be clinically ill with a grade one, or they can be ill with a grade two, three, four, or five. It doesn't really seem to matter at all. All right, let's move on to the next slide here. So here we have just a couple of examples now. Uh, Dr. Wong Ming Ju uh, sent me this image last year and a big thank you. Uh, thank you for sending this image of a case that they had just after we ran a hepatobiliary course last year. And, and uh, this image said, Philip, I've got this case. Um, you might want to use it in teaching. Here it is. We're talking about gallbladder mucosal. So uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ju, for sending through this, uh, this image here. Um, here's another image here. This was from Sound Diagnostics website here. This is a evidence of uh, a gallbladder mucosal here. Now we can see some free abdominal fluid right up at the top of this particular image here. Now this could uh, more than likely be due to gallbladder rupture in this particular patient. Um, it could be due to focal wall necrosis and perhaps inflammation on the uh, serosal surface of our gallbladder. Um, but this seems to be quite a lot of fluid. So if I saw this, I would be wanting to get some of that fluid to see if I had just a, a mild peritonitis or whether or not I had a biliary peritonitis. Um, and here's an image here of a gallbladder mucosal that has ruptured as it is being uh, removed and we can see the ruptured gallbladder um, here and uh, we can uh, see uh, we can see the uh, gallbladder mucosal material oozing out of this uh, out of this gallbladder i've just seen a question which is why i got uh, got distracted there is there any difference in the ultrasound images between dogs and cats uh, again because we don't have a whole lot of information in cats. I'm not really sure about that. The system that was developed was a system for dogs. There's also a three grade system that's been developed as well uh, that, um, that may be more applicable to cats, but we simply don't have enough cases in cats to be able to reliably mention uh, that as well. Awesome. Let's move on to the next image here. This is free fluid uh, surrounding um, a mucosal here. So we have a gallbladder mucosal here, and this is we have free abdominal fluid sitting above, and uh, this is a little bit of an ultrasound, distal acoustic shadow down here. But we certainly have free abdominal fluid sitting around a gallbladder mucosal. This makes me very nervous. You notice how this uh, part of the image here, the the gallbladder sediment seems to be sort of streaky and one could almost convince yourself that this was from a patient that had a ruptured gallbladder and this would be a surgical emergency for uh, these particular patients. Um, a good question here. I recently imaged a gallbladder with a hyperechoic structure inside, some kind of cystic structure surrounded by bile. Could it also be a mucosal? Uh, yes, it could. It could be a cholelith as well. It would be interesting to radiograph that patient because sometimes you'll see uh, you'll see uh, cholelith on radiographs, but also 
uh, gallbladder mucosils, because they're a thick mucus, they don't tend to cause a whole heap of distal acoustic shadowing in your patient, whereas a cholelith usually does. It usually reflects all of the sound. Um, so yes, it could be a, a, a mucosil uh, in that instance. Um, and Joey's just mentioned it's so common for geriatric small breed dogs to have an echo and find a grade one appearance with multiple follow-ups that just don't change. How do we know which one needs surgery? I'm going to talk about that in a little bit when it comes to treatment. But we've reached a pause in proceedings here and I think I've managed to pick up a lot of the questions. But if I have missed your question, then please uh, type your question in. Well, I am going to tell you a little bit more about this abdominal emergencies in a small animal practice course. The medical emergencies course, a four-week online course, starts April 12, 2021. Uh, we have in this the talking about the acute abdomen, acute pancreatitis, acute gastroenteritis. This is not only talking about parvo, but any types of gastroenteritis. There'll be standard operating procedures or practice protocols based on the latest literature on uh, management of intestinal infectious diseases, uh, as well as uh, fluid therapy recommendations and everything. And uh, finally, we'll talk about acute liver failure as well. Oh, I think nowadays you're not allowed to call, say, anything's a failure. It would be acute liver deferred success or something like that. The liver is not working well, but it, it, it might want to do better later on. Acute liver failure is what we'll talk about. We will have lots of things. There's a course ebook. And there's some standard operating procedures. Uh, we'll have literature reviews in there as well. And the exciting news I just confirmed from CRC Press, they are working with us to produce a free course ebook as well. So this is in addition to the notes that I'm writing for the course as well, but they have a, a collection of absolutely amazing references uh, that they are letting us handpick some chapters out of specific to this course written by world experts in veterinary medicine. Uh, and that is a free addition to the course that you'll be able to download. So, and it'll be yours to keep forever. So that is something that's very, very exciting that we're adding to this course as well. All right, now just scan back up, make sure I haven't uh, lost any questions at all. Thank you so much for asking all of those. Let's talk about treatment of uh, gallbladder mucus steels. There are two types of treatment that we can undertake. We can have medical treatment um, and there's surgical treatment. Uh, I guess there's three types. There's medical and then surgery. I'll mention that in a little bit as well. Medical treatment, because this is a problem with the gallbladder epithelium secreting abnormal mucus, medical treatment is unlikely ever to be completely effective. The mucosal contents are semi-solid and they're unlikely to pass with the use of cholyretics like ursodeoxycholic acid. Survival times are shorter with medical treatment than with surgery. Having said that, they're still quite long. So there was a question just before about uh, what do I do in these old patients with gallbladder mucosils and they may have a grade one, they're not showing any symptoms, what do I do with those? Well, if you do nothing, there's a potential risk that they may progress. You can keep re-ultrasounding them or you could start them on some medical treatment. And we'll talk about medical treatment in a second. Um, the risk to the patient is certainly higher than if you take them to surgery when they're asymptomatic, um, but there may be other reasons why you might not want to take your elderly patient with a gallbladder mucus heal to surgery. They've got concurrent heart disease, if they've got an underlying medical condition that's difficult to manage, maybe they've got an underlying endocrinopathy that we need to think about managing to start with. Um, you can actually get resolution. There was a case report of two dogs with hypothyroidism that were both treated with uh, levothyroxine that had their gallbladder mucosil disappear with good control of their underlying uh, thyroid uh, hypothyroidism. So uh, by all means, you can, you certainly should uh, manage the underlying endocrinopathy if you discover one that is there. But survival times, I mean, I mentioned they're still quite long. They're well over a thousand days. So you're looking at maybe three or four years still with medical management. And, you know, if you've got other conditions where surgery is not possible, you can by all means use medical treatment. 
mortality rate with surgery, because this is the other treatment option we have. And when we first look at this, we say, well, there's a mortality rate of 20 to 40% uh, with surgery. And for many, many years, every journal article that was published on gallbladder mucosal said surgery for gallbladder mucosal is associated with a mortality rate of 20 percent there's lots of studies i think four or five studies where the mortality rate was 20 or 21 percent there's a few where it's been as high as as uh, as 40 percent and so this doesn't sound great as we take an elderly as 12 year old small little yorkshire terrier or something like that with a gallbladder mucus seal and we say please let's take your dog to surgery and uh his mortality rate risk is potentially 40 percent um but uh, it's it's better that we perform the surgery um no no one's really going to think that that's a great option i wouldn't think that's a great option however more recent studies or oh, sorry those studies that had mortality rates of between 20 and 40 percent were all conducted on dogs that were clinically ill at the time of surgery so once your patient has a ruptured gallbladder and you take them to surgery their mortality rate within the first 14 days can be as high as 20 to 40 percent however if you take a healthy patient that has a gallbladder mucosal and take them to surgery your mortality rate is two percent if you perform it as an elective procedure. Survival times are long. We're talking over 2,000 or up to 2,000 days, okay, uh, for survival time, uh, notwithstanding the development of any other illness. And the long-term outcome for patients that recover or survive the first two weeks of surgery is really, really good. And this is where surgery, if you go to a surgery lecture on gallbladder mucoseals, this is where the surgeons get very, very excited because low mortality rate, really good outcome if you're performing the surgery on a healthy patient, one without symptoms. So how do we optimize outcome in our patient? Well, we need to stabilize the patient, correct an underlying endocrinopathy if it's there, um, talk about fluid therapy if you have a symptomatic patient, by all means, these guys probably do need surgery sooner rather than later, but we do need to stabilize them first, okay? We need to stabilize our clinically unwell patient. Let's say you've diagnosed a patient with gallbladder rupture secondary to gallbladder mucosal. These patients require surgery, otherwise they will develop sepsis and most of them will die. So fluid therapy, using just isotonic crystalloids. Most of these patients are developing, if they have ruptured gallbladder, they're developing systemic inflammation and sepsis. And I don't use synthetic colloids in these patients as a precaution because of the slightly higher risk of them developing uh, acute kidney injury as well. So um, stabilize the patient with fluid therapy, treat them for shock. If shock is present, treat them with shock rates of fluids to get improvement in your perfusion parameters, heart rate, uh, capillary refill time, blood pressure, and so on. You want to try to normalize your blood pressure, a systolic arterial blood pressure of between 100 and 120 millimeters of mercury. That's our golden aim or the, the, the figure that we're after when we're treating our patients with IV fluid therapy. Then we decrease our fluid therapy rates to maintenance plus hydration deficits and any ongoing losses your patients might have. Manage infection. This is a really interesting one because most patients, even with gallbladder rupture, do not have concurrent infection. And I've got some data from some papers I'll show you in a little bit, but very few dogs actually have infection as an underlying cause for uh, for their gallbladder rupture. However, we are taking our patients to surgery. There are a small number that do have infection uh, in their biliary tree. And if I have a patient who has systemic inflammation or is showing signs of sepsis, then I will definitely manage infection or the risk of an infection with antibiotic therapy. So uh, for these patients, uh, we would use a beta-lactam antibiotic, something like kefazolin or amoxicillin. And uh, most of the bacteria we get out are gram-positive and gram-negative aerobes or facultative aerobes. So we're looking at uh, facultative anaerobes, uh, things like E. coli, for example. And so you could use metronidazole to treat anaerobes or enrofloxacin or another fluoroquinolone to treat aerobes in those patients if you wanted to extend the spectrum of antibiotic coverage. 
Patients with severe illness are oftentimes in sepsis, as we've already mentioned, and many of these patients will have disorders of glucose metabolism. Some of them will be hyperglycemic, uh, some of them will be hypoglycemic. So we need to just make sure that we optimize our patient's glucose concentrations or normalize it, that we're testing for coagulation abnormalities in patients. If we're gonna take these patients to surgery, and they have a prolonged clotting time, uh, prolonged APTT, PT, thrombocytopenia suggestive of disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. That is one of the indications to provide transfusion therapy for our patients. They are at a higher risk for bleeding in the intraoperative period, and we're going to be approaching a vascular organ like the liver to try to dissect free the gallbladder so that we can remove it. So these patients definitely do bleed more, and so uh, uh, managing coagulopathy with transfusions is, uh, is recommended. Gastrointestinal support to reduce nausea, so using uh, drugs like meropotent, uh, metoclopramide uh, potentially, uh, and ondansetron uh, in order to try to uh, reduce nausea and improve patient comfort seems like a reasonable thing to do. Some people will also use um, some people will also use uh, omeprazole in order to decrease gastric acid secretion as well. Uh, uh, if they're concerned, if there's evidence of hematemesis in our patient, uh, where we're vomiting up uh, dark brown coffee grounds that suggest they may have gastric ulcers and so on. In terms of preoperative drainage, there's a question mark here. Should we pop a needle into the gallbladder and drain out some of this fluid before surgery? to reduce the amount of pressure that's in there, maybe reduce the amount of leakage before we get to surgery. Just type in a yes or a no. There's no right or wrong answer. There's, you won't be judged at all here, uh, but just curious as to what our thoughts are. And while you're doing that, I am going to, uh, going to answer a question uh, from Alicia, who's just sort of said, just to clarify, if it's ruptured, then we'll be pretty much showing signs of peritonitis and sepsis, so uh, uh, surgery is warranted and antibiotics are warranted even though the actual gallbladder may not necessarily be infected. Short answer to that, Alicia, is yes. If your patient is showing signs of sepsis, they probably need antibiotic coverage. Another question from Dr. Nutt, could gallbladder mucosal happen with a gallbladder halo sign? I don't know that the halo sign is one of those things that we classically associate with gallbladder mucosal edema, and there wasn't anything that I could find in the literature of a consistent note uh, that the halo sign was a consistent finding in patients with gallbladder mucosal. So I'm not necessarily uh, certain that there's a, a link between the two of those. So nobody wants to aspirate the bile. It's usually thick. Um, how big does a needle have to be? And we've got a fragile gallbladder. And if it hasn't ruptured before we stick our needle in it, it's probably going to rupture when we stick our needle in it uh, because we're going to have to suck this stuff out. So absolutely, the evidence overwhelmingly suggests we should not do that. So awesome. Go, you guys. Well done. Analgesia. These guys are painful. So opioid analgesia, fentanyl, plus or minus ketamine, plus or minus lidocaine would be my choice if I was to take these animals to surgery. Uh, if you don't have fentanyl in your practice, you can use something like uh, methadone. But I would suggest adding something like ketamine continuous infusion and lidocaine continuous infusion, uh, as well as background analgesia. Uh, in between your boluses of methadone to reduce your reliance on isoflurane for anesthesia because isoflurane is so hypotensive and a lot of these patients, if we are taking them to surgery when they're sick, uh, are oftentimes borderline hypotensive to begin with. So we want to try to avoid hypotensive anesthetic medications. Um, we want to try to reduce the doses of anything that is extensively metabolized in the liver, and most of them are diazepams extensively metabolized in the liver, so is ketamine, so is propofol, so is alfaxalone. So everything's metabolized in the liver except for isoflurane. Uh, so we just want to reduce the doses of all of our injectable 
uh, anesthetic and analgesic drugs because they're going to be lasting a little bit longer if we have a patient who's got a concurrent hepatopathy. And we're going to use less isoflurane because isoflurane is really hypotensive. So low doses of everything and make sure you pre-warm your patient. Get them uh, with a bear hugger or warming device for at least 10 minutes before surgery. Keep them nice and warm because uh, hypothermia in surgery is a major risk factor for ongoing bleeding. Okay, And these patients oftentimes have coagulopathies to begin with. So what sort of protocol? Opioids, preferably not morphine. Why have I written that there? Well, morphine in theory causes constriction of the sphincter of OD. Uh, and the sphincter of OD is uh, the juncture at which the, the common bile duct expresses itself into or empties out into the duodenum. And we don't want to risk a spasm in that sphincter while we have a patient who has a uh, potentially gallbladder hypertension. Um, ketamine, uh, we can use lidocaine, propofol or alfaxalone and use isoflurane at the lowest possible dose. We've already mentioned that as well. The surgery itself, um, has anybody done these surgeries, uh, cholecystectomy themselves? I'm just really curious from uh, a from a, a teaching perspective and those who might be likely to want to do this. Um, in my life as a veterinarian, I'm mostly an emergency vet, but I have spent quite a bit of time doing veterinary anesthesia. I spent some years working in a surgical referral practice where we did a number of these procedures, and I have done a, a few myself as well. And uh, they are uh, sometimes nice surgeries to do, sometimes they're not nice surgeries to do as well. Um, so if you, my advice to you is if you are planning or thinking that this is something that you would want to do for a patient, my advice would be to seek uh, some uh, tuition, go and spend some time with a surgical referral practice or a specialist in which you can gain the necessary skill and also practice on cadavers before you're doing it on a, on a, on a patient. So, um, but I'll just move through these things. The, the things that can go wrong in surgery is bleeding, biliary leakage, bile duct obstruction and infection in these patients. Now I know I've mentioned infection doesn't occur that commonly, but things can go wrong. Hemorrhage, why does hemorrhage occur? Well, it occurs because we are dissecting the gallbladder away from the liver. And so the liver will tend to bleed quite a bit. Okay, when we're, when we're doing our surgery, it just oozes blood. That's why we want to normalize clotting times in uh, in our patients. Just before I, this comment disappears, I just want to address it. Rachel's asked, does methadone cause the same concerns as morphine with the sphincter of OD? Short answer is no, it doesn't. So uh, methadone doesn't usually cause problems at the sphincter of OD, it's just morphine. Uh, is it worthwhile just referring these patients? Absolutely. If you're not comfortable with the surgery, referral is a great way to go with these patients. Absolutely. I would recommend that. Um, so hemorrhage can occur from our liver. Uh, it can also occur if we don't ligate the artery that supplies our gallbladder uh, uh, well or if our ligatures slip. And they can be really tricky little blood vessels to find once the ligature has slipped. And I have seen that occur. Um, bile duct obstruction. Why would, oh, sorry, biliary leakage again can occur if we have inadequately tied off our, our bile duct, or if we have uh, perhaps left a branch, or, or sorry, if we have um, not been careful with our dissection and have made a small hole or injury in the common bile duct during our dissection. You can use ligature, you can use uh, little uh, hemoclips and things as well. Uh, Absolutely, they're, they're perfectly fine. Um, bile duct obstruction can occur because some of this mucus could be stuck in our bile duct. So we could remove a gallbladder conceivably and have left an obstruction within the common bile duct. And this is one of the big things that surgery is not just a matter of removing the gallbladder. We need to catheterize the common bile duct and flush it so that we know that we have a patent bile duct when uh, we close our patients up. And infection can occur because we are dealing with uh, compounds that uh, that are quite caustic. Uh, we're flushing these sometimes into the intestine. We can end up with uh, intestinal erosions and secondary infections there too. So here's just a couple of diagrams here that are 
uh, put here, uh, really just to highlight that you know here's uh, the uh, here's the arter arterial supply that we need to make sure we're getting uh, ligated. Here is our cystic duct. Here is where we're wanting to tie things off. You want to make sure that you're tying it off above the last hepatic duct that gains entry into the common bile duct. Okay, so that you've got uh, you've got drainage of all of your hepatic ducts into the common bile duct. Um, and that you're not making your ligatures down here and potentially leaving uh, bile that may be leaking out of your liver into the abdomen. So again, uh, we're going to be ligating our blood vessel. We're going to be ligating our common bile duct after we dissect it free of the liver, which has been done here with Metzenbaum scissors. Um, usually they suggest uh, one clamp here, one clamp here, and then uh, in the middle, and then a, a, a hemoclip there as well. And this diagram down the bottom here really outlines one of the ways. This is a um, retrograde flushing of the, the bile duct there where we make an incision in the duodenum and pass either a small red rubber feeding tube or I've seen even angiocaths just passed in uh, through the sphincter of OD up into the common bile duct and this is just flushed out with saline as well. I've just got, there's a really good question that I probably would save to the end, but I'm going to answer it now because it's come up a couple of times. Um, how do we differentiate common sludge from a mucosal if there are no clinical signs? Common sludge is usually gravity dependent, so it usually sits down one end of the gallbladder. And if you roll a patient over, then and it moves to the other side of the gallbladder, whereas a mucosal is usually a solid mass of tissue that's usually not, uh, or of mucus that's not gravity dependent. That's how I would normally uh, normally uh, assess that. And if you've got non-gravity dependent mass-like structure within the lumen of your gallbladder, then that's when I would probably either recommend referral for further workup or assessment, and then maybe scheduling some surgery if the clients were uh, amenable to that or arranging some medical treatment otherwise. Here's just a couple of photographs here. Here's passing a tube down into the duodenum here just to uh, retrograde uh, flush, the, uh, flush the common bile duct. Um, this gallbladder is being dissected away from the liver lobe um, here. This will bleed a little bit. Now just to note that because there is a small risk in some patients that there may be infection and not a huge risk, 5-10% or thereabouts, it is recommended not to use the physical hemostatic agents like abatine foam or something like that um, because these uh, sorts of structures if they get infected uh, they can act as a nidus and set up a really big infection in there so direct pressure is usually what i would use uh, you can also use tranexamic acid sprayed directly onto the liver surface or onto a swab and then apply that directly against the liver it's an antithrombolytic drug and that will help your blood clots last a little little bit longer. So you can actually spray, uh, you know, something like um, one to five milligrams per kilo onto a swab and actually apply that directly onto, uh, onto, the, onto the liver surface or apply that directly to the liver surface via a swab or lap sponge. But I would avoid putting anything that, uh, I would avoid putting anything like avatine foam or the, the, the um, little gel, uh, gel foam uh, hemostatic agents on the liver in case they get those get infected. All right, um, we had a couple of questions there just about what analgesics we prefer. Fentanyl, uh, ketamine and lidocaine would be what I would be using for this surgery, including after surgery, pre, during and afterwards. Um, and um, I'll give you some doses now. So fentanyl, usually for the preoperative period, it's usually around four micrograms per kilo per hour. Ketamine, about half a milligram per kilo per hour. And lidocaine, about one milligram per kilo per hour. During surgery, I would increase those dose rates um, by two times. So basically my fentanyl is going to be about eight micrograms per kilo per hour, ketamine about one to 1 1.2 milligrams per kilo per hour, and lidocaine about two milligrams per kilo per hour. And that will mean I can use most of the time, you'll be able to drop your isoflurane concentration to around about sort of 0.6% or thereabouts, and it really helps your blood pressure 
uh, really nicely. Um, let me see. Now, there was a question um, uh, that was asked just about uh, parameters of, of abdominal fluid. Yes, you can use your IDEX machine for that. Do I advise it against using laparoscopic removal? No. For, for those that use uh, laparoscopic surgical techniques uh, and are really good at them, they can be used extremely effectively for sure. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next slide because I know I'm running a little bit over time. Uh, here's just the application of direct pressure here just onto the liver surface as the gallbladder is being uh, manipulated. This is a really sensible idea, putting a stay suture in the gallbladder just so you can apply gentle traction to it. Uh, I have seen some people use Alice tissue forceps uh, on there. I'm not a huge fan because you don't know where in this patient's gallbladder the wall might be very fragile and it can rupture with those. Um, here is a gallbladder uh, that is uh, that is has been freed, and we can see where the uh, where the uh, retraction suture there, the stay suture, was placed in that particular um, in that particular gallbladder. And here's just a couple of hemoclips there over the common bile duct, uh, where the I think red or green or orange arrow is, and where the yellow arrow is, that is across the blood vessel there as well. So after we've done all of this. What's the outcome and the prognosis? Well, let's have a look at a little bit of literature. There was a JAFMA article published in 2004, probably the first big study of gallbladder mucoceles. Uh, what they said was elevated ALT, ALP, and bilirubin were significantly higher in dogs with gallbladder rupture. The sensitivity of ultrasound for detection of gallbladder rupture was 85.7%, so they had good sensitivity. 21.7% uh, mortality, infection in about 8.7% of dogs. I mentioned sort of roughly 5 to 10% earlier Earlier on, um, that's really where this number, uh, that number came from, was the study here. Infection about 8.7% of dogs, uh, 50 to 75% of dogs had persistent increases in liver enzymes. So we really don't know why that is the case. Uh, certainly, they didn't in 2004, and we're not really any the wiser right now. There's a uh, Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine article from 2019 looking at 89 dogs. They said survival with surgery, the mean time was 1,802 days. With medical treatment, um, the survival time was 1,340 days, so still actually pretty long. If you were sick enough to need medical treatment and then surgery within 10 days, your mean survival was 203 days. So patients that are sick, before they arrive in your clinic are a lot worse off. They're much more likely to have a shorter life um, and they're probably more likely to die around surgery as well. Interestingly, they found in this study that elevated creatinine and phosphorus, sorry, there should be and phosphorus, uh, were negative prognostic indicators across all groups, surgery, medical and, medical and surgery as well. Okay. Uh, in, I think, the same study, the 14-day mortality rates for surgery were around 20%, 19.6%, with medical at 14 days, 3%, and medical and surgery, 0%, but the duration of medical treatment was as long as 90 days before surgery was applied. But then once surgery was applied, presuming surgery was applied because medical treatment was ultimately unsuccessful and the patients needed urgent surgery, their mortality rate and survival was a lot higher as well. There's a JAVMA article in 2018 that looked at 70 dogs and the mortality rate for elective cholecystectomy was 2%, but for non-elective or emergency cholecystectomy, once it's ruptured and things are looking bad, was 20%. Vomiting, lethargy, anorexia, icterus and azotemia, not axotemia, azotemia was less likely to survive. It uh, didn't mean that they didn't survive, but more of them failed to survive as well. And in a vet surgery article from 2013, there were 43 dogs. They found the sensitivity of ultrasound for diagnosis of gallbladder mucosal was 75%. Uh, they only found infection in one out of 37 dogs. So 
Um, in fact, some other studies even had nine, you know, eight or nine percent. And even in one earlier study that had up to 66.7 percent infection rates in their patients, it was a very skewed population. And this is where reading the whole journal article can be really beneficial. Uh, so I think overall, probably what we find is an infection rate of probably around that 10% mark, maybe a little bit higher. Uh, once you start to get patients who are very, very sick, then the infection rate goes up, and that is the reason why we need to consider antibiotic uh, therapy at the time of surgery. If you manage to get some free abdominal fluid uh, before surgery, then I would be submitting that for culture and sensitivity uh, regardless. Gallbladder rupture, interestingly, in the vet surge article was not associated with mortality, but concurrent liver inflammation was really common. 94% of patients had uh, had uh, had concurrent um, liver inflammation both before and after surgery. Um, should we biopsy the liver? Um, if the, if the, oftentimes the liver, and it's a really good question, thanks for asking that, the liver itself in many cases of ultrasound reports of gallbladder mucus, it actually looks quite abnormal. Uh, and it can have a diffuse, mottled, hypoechogenic sort of texture to it. And so biopsying the liver is certainly within the realms of something that's pretty reasonable to do, if uh, particularly if you have concurrent hepatopathy to see if there's anything else going on. Um, so I think that biopsying the liver is a reasonable thing to do, especially if you've got evidence that it's not looking normal uh, and uh, clinical pathology evidence that there's something else going on in the liver. Again, prognosis following surgery, elevated postoperative blood lactate is a negative prognostic indicator. This was really interesting. It was a 30% increase in mortality with each one millimole per liter increase in blood lactate concentration in the post-operative period. Remember before I said that noradrenaline is associated with hyperlactatemia. So increasing noradrenaline secretion is associated with hyperlactatemia. And this is because we get massive amounts of glycolysis occurring in response to noradrenaline release. So much so that we end up with saturation of the conversion of pyruvate to, um, to acetyl-CoA. And so we get diversion of pyruvate to lactate within the, uh, within the uh, intracellular environment outside of the mitochondria. And this is one of the reasons why we get this massive increase in lactate concentration uh, in response to huge noradrenaline release. And it's not always in in response to hypoperfusion. So I just want to make that quite clear. Now, interestingly, in this study as well, they found postoperative hypotension with a blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury systolic, um, they were 20 times more likely to die. And gallbladder necrosis, if that was found on necropsy, uh, had a 30%, 33% mortality as well. Were there other studies? Yes, there have been some others as well. And just to summarize uh, what was found in those, gallbladder rupture, they were 2.7 times more likely to die. So uh, not quite as bad as the uh, vet surge study that we just looked at. If they survived surgery, 66% were alive at two years in another study that was there as well. What are some other prognostic indicators uh, for surgery? Pre-anesthetic prognostic indicators, if you've got prolonged clotting times, low serum albumin, elevated bilirubin, an increase in percentage of band neutrophils, um, increasing age, uh, elevated anesthetic, pre-anesthetic heart rate, or elevated blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. GGT and phosphorus were all associated with negative prognosis in patients. It doesn't mean you're going to die, it's just that your chances of not doing well are a little bit higher. And it's no surprise really because the, uh, the sicker you are, uh, the less likely you are to have a favorable outcome in surgery. And that's been documented in the ASA mortality rates for anesthesia. And certainly when we're dealing with gallbladder disease, we know that patients that have more systemic disease are less likely to do as well as patients without it. So that's really where we are now. I'm hoping that that has been helpful and interesting for you. Um, 
couple of questions there as well. I will answer some questions. Uh, Joey's asked a question, will cholecystectomy lead to acute bradycardia or sinus arrest or even atrial fibrillation due to the vagal effect? It certainly can. Once you're clamping it off um, or manipulating it, you can get an acute bradycardia or sinus arrest. Uh, and so you're, uh, whoever's looking after your anesthetic, just word them up about what you're going to be doing so that they know to manage that patient appropriately. Does post-op lidocaine improve the prognosis? Uh, it improves analgesia. It reduces the number of arrhythmias, of ventricular tachyarrhythmias you might get in a patient who's got sepsis, uh, but I'm not sure that it's been linked to survival uh, and prognostic outcome for the patients that have got gallbladder mucosal. Any dietary recommendations after surgery? That's an, almost an entire uh, lecture all in itself is dietary recommendations. Most of the time, you, you don't need to worry too much about dietary recommendations. Some uh, clinicians and medicine clinicians will recommend diets that are lower in fat content, uh, but there's not a whole lot of evidence to suggest that after cholecystectomy that they're necessarily required. Um, let me see. Uh, what about ALP elevation in old dogs with some sludge in the gallbladder? I think that the key from what I was reading in all of these journal articles is that um, um, an elevation in alkaline phosphatase can have numerous causes. If you've got some gallbladder sludge in there that's gravity dependent, for example, and you've got an increase in alkaline phosphatase, the two may not necessarily be linked. There could be uh, corticosteroid um, uh, induced increases in alkaline phosphatase, um, and there could be other things going on, inflammatory bowel disease, neoplasia, and those kinds of things as well. So I, it's, uh, it's one of those things I think that would be worthwhile looking at and uh, investigating the patient's other comorbidities if their presence. Uh, oh, now medical treatment for, uh, for patients who are not going to go to surgery, that's really great. So pretty much the medications that we would use to stabilize a patient are the ones that we might consider to use for medical treatment. So the ones I mentioned before, ursa deoxycholic acid, I know it can be quite expensive, um, but uh, that is one that is a cholieretic. You may have limited success in removing any of that material, but it's one of the ones that the medicine specialists are talking about. Uh, medications to control nausea and vomiting. So um, uh, metoclopramide, for example, or meropotent citrate, um, on Dancitron or Dilacitron, and in some cases using uh, acid suppression drugs as well can be a gastric acid suppressing drug. So famotidine, for example, may be uh, considered. Um, analgesia, yes, something like gabapentin uh, may be of some benefit in some patients that have low-grade abdominal discomfort as well. Uh, so those are the kinds of drugs that, uh, that you would use. In terms of how long you use them, um, there's not a whole lot of clear evidence for that, but you could see from one of those studies, the average length of medical treatment in one of those studies that, uh, that was looking at outcome versus you know, surgery versus medical versus medical and then surgery, the average duration of medical treatment was eight months or eight to 10 months. So uh, for quite some time, uh, you and you know, I'm of the mind that if you're seeing some improvement, maybe carry on with the medications. If the clients are fund restricted, then you might need to pick and choose what medications improve the patient's quality of life and keep an eye on that mucosal, bearing in mind that it's uh, not likely to resolve on its own. Will sludge respond to ursodeoxycholic acid? It's possible that it might because because it's chol cholieretic, so you've got a large volume of bile being produced, and so there's a chance that it will pull some of that sludge with it. I'm not sure that it will dissolve it, but just by virtue of the fact that it's flooding your biliary tract with a much higher concentration or higher volume of bile, uh, it's possible that uh, that you might drag some of that sludge out as well. What's the most sensitive modality for gallbladder rupture? That's really interesting because ultrasounds, you know, we, we know has some uh, shortcomings in detecting it. Uh, CT as well was not actually found to be all that superior. Some people have used uh, also uh, nuclear imaging uh, scans as well, and they haven't found that to be much better either. So it's ultrasound currently, uh, and then the most sensitive would be 
at surgery to diagnose whether or not it's ruptured. How can you check the bile duct patency with a catheter if you've already located the gallbladder duct? Great, Sylvian, I'm, uh, Sylvain, I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, so uh, the reason we do this uh, is that we're going to check the gallbladder, uh, sorry, the bile duct patency before we take the gallbladder out. Okay, so before you take the gallbladder out, you're going to assess the bile duct patency. Um, so that's the order we would do things. Uh, if you're going to do it normal grade flushing, you can actually make a small incision in the in the gallbladder and pass your catheter normal grade down the common bile duct and flush it there, and uh, and then remove the gallbladder if the bile duct is patent. Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, I think we talked about the drugs, post-op feeding, fat soluble vitamins. Uh, these animals still produce bile, uh, so they they still produce bile in the liver and or the bile salts in the liver. So usually long term, uh, it's, it's not thought to be all that necessary to add uh, necessarily fat soluble vitamins to these patients. With hepatic antioxidants, so for, oh yes, yeah, sorry, hepatic antioxidants, that's the, um, the other thing that I uh, was going to mention for medical treatment. If you've got low grade increases in liver enzymes, um, either pre surgery or if you're going to medically manage these patients or in the post-surgical surgical period if you do have a mild hepatopathy present using either uh, acetylcysteine or SAMI or milk thistle would be fine. SAMI is per perfectly fine. Um, acetylcysteine, they're all glutathione precursors in one degree or another and it's glutathione is the, um, is the product that we're after. It's one of the most important hepatic antioxidants and that's why we're using those. Now, can ursodeoxycholic acid rupture the gallbladder if you have a bile duct obstruction? Yes, it can. What's our decision making on deciding when to take to surgery? For symptomatic patients, do we try medical treatment and monitor, and if not improving, then surgery? I think that's a brilliant question. So the way that, uh, the way that we look at these things is if we have a symptomatic patient we probably need to take that patient to surgery and medically stabilizing them in the short term. So for perhaps uh, 24 to 72 hours, maybe a little bit longer to try to get that patient's, uh, correct that patient's fluid abnormalities to try to, um, to try to improve patient comfort. I probably wouldn't be waiting any more than sort of 24, 48 hours if the patient was clinically unwell. Uh, would you still use acetylcholic uh, acid if you've got dilated ducts and therefore a moderate blockage? Oh, now we get into semantics there um, of whether or not to use acetylcholic acid. Um, if I don't have ultrasonographic evidence of common bile duct obstruction, which is a tortuous, thickened, wide uh, common bile duct, it looks like a big swollen river in flood. Um, if I've got that, then I don't use acetylcholic acid. If my gallbladder uh, tapers down to a nice narrow point, I probably don't have uh, a, a, a bile duct obstruction and I would be, feel more comfortable using acetylcholic acid. If there's a little bit of an increase in the uh, dimension of your cystic ducts and your uh, common bile duct, um, I usually consult with a medicine specialist on that one, so I would recommend doing the same thing. Call a medicine specialist, send them your images and get their expert opinion on that on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're doing the surgery in cats, would you flush the bile duct? Absolutely. Um, I think I've just answered the question from Rachel on when do we decide if a gall um, common bile ducts is obstructed. Um, okay, just to recap, and this is probably where we'll finish the questions. Just to recap, if this is an incidental finding, so now we're equipped with all of this knowledge, and now we tomorrow we're going to go to practice and we put our ultrasound probe on a patient who's asymptomatic and we find a lump of stuff sitting in the middle of their gallbladder, what do we do next? Well, armed with the knowledge that we have, what we do know is that uh, early surgery is better than waiting until a patient is symptomatic. So if it is a patient who doesn't have significant comorbidities, I can test for you know hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease if I think my patient has them. Um, if I have a patient who's just got this sediment sitting in and, and I think it looks like 
a gallbladder mucosal, maybe a grade one or a grade two, and it's sitting there, I would have a long talk with the client about the potential risks of things not going quite so well if this led to gallbladder rupture. And the thing with gallbladder mucoseals is we don't necessarily know how rapidly the disease progresses, but what we do seem to appreciate is that sometimes dogs are cruising along pretty happily and one day they feel sick and we ultrasound them and they've got evidence of gallbladder rupture. And that is associated with a 20% mortality rate at the time of surgery. So if it were me, I would probably be talking with a surgeon to say, what's your experience with this disease? Is this something that we should be doing surgery on sooner rather than later? And that would be the information that I'd be relaying to the client that I want to have a chat with a surgeon because the evidence suggests that when you've got this stuff, probably surgery sooner um, is better than leaving it to surgery later. Um, you could try to manage it medically. Um, it's probably not going to be successful, but the patient is may well do okay for quite some time. Um, so that's the that's really I guess where the um, where the, the questions um, answered as far as the client is concerned. What's the best treatment if you see small echogenic bile sludge balls on ultrasound as an incidental finding? Probably the same thing as well. Oh, phew. Would we submit the bile for cytology and culture before surgery? Um, yes. So if you've got bile that's leaked out into the abdominal cavity or if you have uh, decided that you're going to get a sample of bile, then I would certainly send it off for culture. Even um, at the time of surgery, it is worthwhile submitting the whole gallbladder for culture and sensitivity as well uh, because there may well be components within that bile that culture bacteria. Well, I am so sorry to have gone over time, but thank you so much for coming along tonight. This lecture has been brought to you by the Abdominal Emergencies and Small Animal Practice course that's coming up starting on April 12th. It's a four-week online course. Don't forget, we cover a bunch of stuff uh, in this course. We've got a surgical abdominal emergencies course coming up later in the year where we'll talk about things like GDV and uh, we'll talk a little bit about biliary surgery, but we'll talk about other surgical things as well. And don't forget, there will be course ebooks, standard operating procedures or protocols, literature reviews, and a CRC Press ebook that is free as well. Lots of stuff to look forward to in the course. If you can join us, that would be absolutely amazing. We'll make sure that we look after you and help you answer as many questions as you have during the course as well. I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of you tremendously from logging in for all over the world. Uh, I do hope that you have enjoyed the lecture as much as I enjoyed finding out about gallbladder mucoseals before we presented the lecture tonight. Uh, it's the it's the uh, world premiere of this particular lecture, I have to say. So uh, it's a, a, a thing that I've stolen off one of the lectures that we had last week. It was delivering the lecture that he wrote for the first time. It's the first time I've spoken about gallbladder mucosal. So hopefully that's been a really helpful lecture and interesting. Stay safe, everyone. I know it's a dangerous world we live in out there with infectious diseases and everything. I wish you all uh, a very happy and safe period until we meet again. Thank you and good evening.